let's click on in, shall we? Well, here it is. Um, I bet you thought it would never happen. Uh, I can tell you there are a number of politicians who thought it would never happen either. I can't tell you the number of MPs that we would lobby in Parliament House that said, look, you might be able to get some regulations, but you will never get a law. Well, look at this. Uh, here it is. And I have to say, tell you that I still get a little emotional seeing this in black and white. After all of this time to see an exposure draft for our legislation, and it couldn't be more clear what this is for. Look at the title of it. Um, this is a great win. It's also a great win for all of us. And I know that everyone on the call is likely to be someone who made a call, who, who hosted a member of parliament. Some people went to Parliament House with us, signed emails, made submissions to inquiries. I'm pretty sure that every single one of you has probably done something to achieve this. And here it is. Uh, this is not just testament to government seeing the right thing. It's also a testament to our ability to, to change things, to work hard together to achieve something. This is an incredible achievement. So as you can see, it's an amendment to the Competition and Consumer Act. That's fantastic because it means it's enforced by the ACCC and it gets all of the enforcement powers that the ACCC has. So that's the body that you know, sues people for, uh, for cartel behavior, for distorting the market. Um, they've got all of the investigation powers. They can make you open up your undie drawer. So that's fantastic. It brings with it all of the penalties that occur if you breach the Competition and Consumer Act. And for our component of it, that's up to $10 million. Um, the interesting news is that this exposure draft released in um, December, on the 18th of December, is only open until the 18th, until, until the 31st of January for comment. So only a six week commentary, and that included all of the Christmas period. That is a hard deadline. The Treasury's view is that there have been enough inquiries. The whole ACCC market study was a major inquiry, and they're going to take that as the consultation for this bill. So that's amazing. So let's have a look at what's in it, shall we? Well, I'll start with what we like about it, because when I've been chatting away with people, they've said, look, don't, don't talk to me about clause 12, subsection E and F. Tell me what you think. So here's our quick back of the envelope, what we think about it. It is principles based. We knew that would be the case because we didn't just want a list of everything that car companies are obliged to share with us on fair and reasonable terms, because we knew they would find something that was not on that list. So there are examples and I'll show you that, but this is a the information that is required to diagnose, service and repair a vehicle. And the principle is, this is what's required for a genuinely competitive market. That's important because when we do have disputes, it's the principles that you leverage. You look at behavior that is contrary to the principles and then act accordingly. So the wording does matter. The wording is pretty good. There's also statements in here about functionality. It makes the statement that you can't give the data to dealers electronically and then give a hard a 1000 page hard copy document to repairers. There's got to be what I'm calling functional equality. It's got to go in the same form. That's great. The whole choice of time period, you know, you can get, you don't have to subscribe for a 10 year period only. You, the subscription times, a day, a week, a month, they're all there. There is a great deal of definition about what is fair and reasonable terms. I can cover that a little bit more in the question time if you like, but there is Australian law precedence for fair and reasonable. They leverage that. And they also talk about the, the price charged internationally. And we already know what the American prices are. So that's handy. There are some good prohibited business practices. So car manufacturers can't force us to use their tools, their parts, or their services. That's important. Um, there is some good adapt adaptability, and I'll talk about that in a moment. And the Treasury's assessed that the business burden, the, the burden of cost for the car manufacturers is 1.5 million a year. Now, I list that as the good because you know how much they're going to scream about increased regulation is going to cost every car owner. We're going to have to pass that charge on. Well, this is less than a dollar a car. I think that's a reasonable investment for car owners to make 
to make sure that we have fair and open competition and maintain affordability of automotive service and repair. So that's, that's the good as well. So I talked about adaptability. The, the, the law unusually makes provision for the minister to be able to respond and react. So to change with new technology, but also to close any loopholes. So any worry that we have that we've got to get this law 100% right, I'd still like to, by the way, 100% right, and then things are still going to happen because we can't predict the future. I love this language that the minister can make regulations and changes in order to deal promptly with attempts to frustrate the scheme. That is fantastic. So, and you can do that without going back to parliament. The thing you worry about when you introduce a new law is it's hard enough to get the law up. It's even harder to change the law because it's got to go on the queue. But this can be done without going back to parliament. That's good news. So let's have a look at it, shall we? So the scheme is divided into a definition of the data providers. We know who they are. That's the car companies. Us, Australian repairers, I won't cover it in great length, but the recipients of the data also include registered training organisations. That's good. That's very exciting. Um, but I won't cover them tonight. Scheme information. And there's, a, there's that broad definition that I mentioned um, for use in conducting diagnostic, servicing or repair activities or training. Um, and scheme vehicles. So we're looking at vehicles produced, um, manufactured on or after the 1st of January 2002. So we go back a fair way. And we're looking at vehicles that are manufactured for use on, on Australian roads. We've got a little bit more on that as we go along. So I know you don't want to know what's in it. So this is scheme information. And I think we're going to have to start to get used to this brand new te terminology. Are you driving a scheme vehicle? And is this part of scheme information? So you're part of the scheme or you're outside of it. So here's all of the scheme information. Now, these are listed as, for example, I, I like the idea that we have a few for examples. I bet you're happy to see electronic log books there, um, installing new parts, which, in, which, which clearly refers to flashing and software updates. We're not sure that's strong enough, but it is there. Um, and manuals and procedures, we already had much of that, but look at this, technical service bulletins, wiring diagrams, technical specs for components and lubricants, and testing procedures. That's mostly in relation to environmental. So the scheme information in the legislation is that principled base, and these four things that I've covered are examples given in the explanatory memorandum to give a sense of what we're providing. But that's not all, of course, that's just an example. Uh, I mentioned um, scheme information. There are things that are now going to be considered outside the scheme. And let me talk about those. So we always knew that we would be excluded from things like trade secrets. We're also going to be excluded from the commercial relationship between the dealer and the manufacturer. We never asked for that, never wanted it. Um, the source codes, we understand that. That's for our parts as well, by the way. So aftermarket parts don't have to share their source codes. We don't need the global positioning data. I never asked to know where our customers are parking or driving. Um, the two areas that we're concerned about, that's why I popped them in red. And right at the end, I'll cover our concerns. Uh, information related to an automated driving system. Now, it is possible to define what is an automated vehicle. They go in five levels and they're determined by the Society of Automotive Engineers. But there isn't necessarily a good definition of what the driving system is. And the legislation uses an example like this. You won't get the data for the chauffeur system or let's say the autopilot. But, but if you need to replace the windscreen, you should be able to replace a windscreen on an automated vehicle. Well, that's a great example because we're already talking to Treasury about, you appreciate that when the windscreen is replaced, we need to recalibrate the sensors. Now, are the sensors part of the automated driving system? Answer, they're not sure. So I'm not sure that line is as clear as we would like it. I'm not sure it's as clear as they need it to be either. So what is the automated driving system? Is it the sensors that tell you that you're going outside of the lane or is it just the autopilot? Hmm, interesting question. They're not necessarily having a good answer. Telematics is not included. Again, we've questioned that. We've talked about um, 
if the OBD port is removed, then getting diagnostic information from the vehicle is going to occur wirelessly. And we want to make sure that we maintain that functionality and that functionality is in the act. So we think that's a contradiction, but I'll cover off some of our concerns right at the end. Data provider, so the definition of who is a data provider, it's clearly the car manufacturers and their legislation doesn't care whether you're overseas, whether you're using a data aggregator, how you do it, but the obligation will rely, will, will rest with the vehicle manufacturer. So that's, that's pretty clear and that definition looks good to us. Um, we are concerned that one of the obligations for the data providers is that they have to supply scheme information within two days. Um, we've explained to Treasury already, and we'll be doing this in our formal submission, that if you give some of the car manufacturers within two days, they're going to take two days. It's not reasonable to expect that a vehicle can be serviced same day at a dealership and will require a two day wait. They were surprised that we would suggest that some manufacturers will wait two days. Um, but uh, yeah, they, they don't live in our world. So we'll be pushing back on the two days. I think sometimes there's a confusion about the data that we want to receive via subscription, which we should be able to get instantly. They know what the, what the lubricants are, what the tire pressure is, they know that now, uh, versus an inquiry we might need to make over something that is quite unique for a, for a vehicle where there are not many vehicles on the road. And in that instance, we understand there might be a time delay, but there should be no delay for regular maintenance and servicing. And we don't want to give them that out. And we'll be making that point strongly. I talked about scheme vehicles. So we're talking about most vehicles that are on the road. These are defined under the Road Vehicle Standards Act. So um, it goes all the way up to fairly light commercials. Um, it doesn't include, <coughs> excuse me, two and three wheel vehicles. So no motorcycles, no farm machinery and no heavy vehicles. But importantly, the minister is able to add vehicles into the scheme without taking this law back to parliament. That is highly significant because I know in particular farm machinery is suffering a great deal from the economic cost of not having access to repair and service information. So this, this, this law can evolve and can include new vehicles. And I think that's an, a good move. So we've always talked about safety and security and the car manufacturers have always said, we, we share everything we can, we only hold back safety and security. So let's look at how that's defined in the act. There is a weird component in the act that says that we will not be receiving repair and service information for uh, electric and hybrid vehicles, uh, particularly relating to the uh, propulsion system. Um, so this is there as a technician safety. So they're looking after our welfare, apparently. Um, we've questioned this already and we will do so in our submission because what they're talking about essentially is an occupational health and, health and safety avenue here. They're not talking about a competition element. They're looking after our welfare. Well, thank you very much. But we actually have an Australian standard that provides direction to workshops that are working on these sorts of vehicles. And uh, they are very clear about gloves, about safety equipment, about fire extinguishers. We are capable of servicing and maintaining these vehicles. And we don't see why the Act should rule those out. We're happy to talk about an accreditation system based on that standard, but we don't wanna see them ruled out and excluded. The rest of the safety and security is about a vetting system. So it allows for safety and security information to be uh, covered by the rules and to allow the development of processes in order to get that information. We've talked about police checks for, uh, for theft related items. So the only safety one that is out in the first instance in this section is electric vehicles. We're not sure we agree with their rationale there. There are some other issues under safety and security, privacy and record keeping, but that's predominantly about the car companies keeping our information safe. So we do need to go through a vetting system where you're providing personal information to the vehicle manufacturers. They're going to be governed by Australia's extensive privacy laws and by how they treat that data and how long they keep that data. That's actually a very good sign. 
So there are a lot of obligations on the data providers. Again, you'll get a, a copy of this. Um, there aren't many obligations on us. And you would know from the journey that we've been on, there's always been a lot of statements about, oh, we can't give it to independent repairers unless, you know, they wear green on a Tuesday and they do this and jump through this hoop. And um, there's not a lot of that at all. I mean, don't share your login details is just about the only one in there. So it's not too much more onerous than your Netflix account. But there is a lot of obligation on the data providers, all of which we are happy to see, um, except for this. And here it is again, the two business days. So um, again, that's in our list of concerns. There are some prohibitions. I mentioned that the car manufacturers cannot force us to buy their tools and equipment. That's a good sign. Uh, but they also can't, um, they can't not share the data because there's a dealer next door. They can't do anything in a geography. You can't have that because we've got someone doing it right next door. A lot of information about an inaccessible format. What's important about that is that if you provide data in an inaccessible format, you will be breaching a main obligation. When you see breaching a main obligation, read $10 million in fines. So there are minor breaches. I've costed those out at about 133,000 for the next one down and for a minor one, about 13,000. Uh, but the big one is um, a $10 million fine. So that's pretty exciting. There are some other things in this act that are interesting. There's a lot of information in there about interaction with the Copyright Act, and that's quite clever. So what the act is saying is that if you take all of your repair and service information and sell it to a third party and say, well, we don't own it anymore, another body owns it, um, the act will override that copyright. You'll have to pay that copyright out, reverse it, or not be able to enforce it. So they're already anticipating some of the loopholes that some of the smaller car manufacturers will go through. There's a lot of dispute resolution. We knew that would be in there. That's good for us because the voluntary system had none. There is something called extraterritoriality, which means, yes, we can sue um, Toyota in Japan. So it doesn't matter that you are have a head office that's based overseas. You will still be, if you're selling vehicles into our market, you will still have to comply with Australian law. And this scheme making the scheme rules. So the act is very principles based with penalties and how, how things are to be enacted. The scheme rules are the lists of what is and isn't inside the, the scheme and what the vetting process might be for some pieces of information. And those will be done under the minister's rulemaking power. The minister also has what is called a scheme advisor. So that is a person or an organization that monitors the scheme, talks to the ACCC about behaviours and practices that are less than productive, helps with mediation and dispute resolution, um, just publishes reports on how the scheme is going. And as I mentioned, the scheme advisor can be a person or it can be an organisation. And we know now that it is likely to be, well, it will be this organisation, because when this draft legislation was released on the 18th of December, the government also announced a $250,000 grant for the industry body. And that will be the new Automotive Service and Repair Authority. So for those of you who have been on this journey for a lengthy time, this is our NASTIF. This is the body that will provide vetting and accreditation, will monitor the flows, and will be able to act quickly where there are systematic breaches by one manufacturer or several manufacturers. And it's made up of the original voluntary agreement signatory parties. We'll have two seats on well, two seats around the table. So that body will, after this legislation um, makes its way through the parliament, that body will start working on operation operationalizing the law. So here are the things we're worried about. We don't like within two days, we think some manufacturers will take exactly two days. And while the Treasury thinks that it's a maximum, it's going to end up being the standard and it's not appropriate. I've spoken to a lot of our partners who are also talking about the two days. I can tell you the roadside assistance people are totally unimpressed with two days. Um, we want to know whether the functional equality really does give us pass through. We, there's, there's no mention of scan tools. There's no mention of pass-through technology. It's implied because we get the same functionality, but is it enough? 
Um, automated vehicle systems, there's no definition of where that system begins and ends. There is a definition of an automated vehicle, but not the system within the vehicle. Um, electric vehicle propulsion systems, we disagree. Um, telemetry, we're going to go again. We might end up having to have that battle, but separately under consumer data rights, because it is the consumer's data. But um, no, we'll go around again. Uh, Fiat Chrysler is keen to take the OBD port out, and we need to make sure that we're ready for that. Um, I just wanted in my last 30 seconds to tell you where we're up to on this journey. So we're right here. We've got the UR here the analyze and review the draft. We're talking to Insurance Council, the right to repair lobby, all of our majors, the tool providers, everyone we can to make sure that we have a good intelligent response. It does close on the 31st of January, can you believe it? And it is apparently a hard close. What happens after that is that Treasury starts working on a final version. In the meantime, we'll go back to Parliament and talk to some of the politicians that have supported us on this journey to get them ready. The final draft gets introduced into the autumn session. That's between March and May. Might be optimistic, but hey, let's be optimistic. It's served us well so far. Uh, we might be talking to you all about getting back in touch with your members of parliament to let them know this act is coming because we want to make sure we get it bumped up in the priority list. Sometimes there's a big queue. There's certainly a big queue now that the politicians haven't been in Canberra over 2020 very much. So we're going to make sure we get up the top. Then we've got to monitor what happens because we've got to go through the lower house, we've got to go through the Senate. You know, the Senate can be dicey and that an amendment can be moved at any time. So we may even look at sending a delegation, popping our polo shirts on and hanging around Parliament House just to give the next push that we need. Then the scheme rules are developed and the law becomes law, L-A-W, on the 1st of July, 2022. Now, please don't be dismayed by that number. The, the choice really was uh, we have that date or if it was an earlier date, we'd end up with transition provisions in the Act. And we didn't want that. We didn't want the law to be moved and the car companies to get 12 months to comply. They need to comply from the 1st of July, 2022. I think that's a better outcome because if you've got a 12 month reprieve, why not get a 14 month reprieve? And we can just go on and on. Now, you'll get a copy of this presentation, but if you would like to look at the exposure draft or even just read through the explanatory memorandum, I would be grateful for any feedback that you would like to give me. I am keen to have that conversation about, are you seeing what I'm seeing? Um, am I missing anything? These, these things are critical for me. So any, any suggestions, any advice, any questions you have are welcome.